Welcome to the Canna BS Detector Podcast. No sugar, all spice. With the industry BS detector in residence, Kristen Yoda. Hello, my Canna BS detectors. Welcome back for another episode with me and a very smart guest calling out bullshit in the cannabis industry and keeping you informed. And I'm happy to have my homie and incredibly intelligent uh, friend, Brad Slaughter, back with me to have a follow-up to the first episode we did that I endearingly entitled Fuck Legalization. Um, And Brad had reached out. I saw him comment on one of my posts saying, well, we do need some kind of legalization. And I'm like, bro, we have to do a follow-up podcast then because you need to convince me of this. So here is Brad. Thanks for joining me again today. Always a pleasure. And um, yeah, so I we already started this conversation and I forgot to hit record. Um, you know, God bless Canvas. Anyways, uh, <laughs> and I'm not even high. I think that's the problem. But anyways, um, so... You wrote an article that just came out about cannabis reparations. And this was one of the things you were talking about with legalization. And I think I'm going to post a link to it in the show notes for everybody. Um, But I think that it's a really interesting point that you're bringing up because I was talking about um, how I don't support legalization, but I do believe there should be some sort of regulation. And you were saying that looking back in history, you know, this has been tried before. So what's happened? Yeah. So ever since, ever since the beginning of uh, this initial prohibition in in America for cannabis, um, and a lot of people like to set it at 1937, but it was, it was actually a little bit before um, there were a lot of, uh, there were, there was a lot of movement on trying to restrict uh, cannabis and alcohol during the start of the prohibition um, when it, took away a lot of those things. Um, but really the thing that stuck was cannabis, obviously because alcohol became legal back again. But since 1937, um, there's been multiple tries by either cities, by councils, by organizations to try to sway the view back of saying this has been in a, in a legal way and a very um, inhumane thing to do to the community at large for uh, criminalizing cannabis, and we need to bring this back because obviously there are benefits. There are things that that have just been propaganda this entire time to support whatever business or whatever conglomerate that is, you know, collecting the most amount of money from it. Um, one of the bigger factors that you know really you know put my mind into perspective of what's going on is the 1970s movement. So during the 1970s. It was when 11, 11 states were decriminalized. This was during Jimmy Carter's, Carter's era. Um, people thought by 1980, uh, and this was shown in um, uh, High Times, was so shown in Normal when they both started during those during that decade. That they really thought that 1980 was the, was the year that cannabis was going to be decriminalized nationwide, and those going to be taken off the SA. Everything was going to be fine. Well, just because 11 states decriminalized it didn't mean it changed the sway of the thought process that might have happened during those given years. So when, whenever Strout got, um, uh, whenever Strout got impl- implicated and you had the, uh, one of the head medical officer for Jimmy Carter get arrested um, after he was found to have done cocaine and cannabis at a high times party, um, it really changed the tone of the nation because then they started seeing a lot of scandals coming out and started connecting the dots with a lot of these issues. Once Reagan yeah. came in the presidency, that's when the war on drugs became really apparent and came to a forefront. And that's what people were fighting about. And we have to remember in the late seventies, that's when the, um, that's when the initial families in action movement, the grassroots movement that was supposed to take out a lot of these drugs, which they focused mainly on cannabis. Um, that's where a lot of that grassroots movement started, which actually became one of the biggest grassroots movement of all time. And then when Nancy Reagan hopped on board and said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to back this. And then, and it, that's when eventually that became just say no. That was the biggest, one of the biggest issues that came about is 
yes, we decriminalized it. And yes, we thought that we were, it was going to be fine and it was going to be decriminalized or legalized nationwide. Everything stopped, support stopped. Um, these decriminalized states didn't have proper regulations. So you have head shops selling cannabis bongs and cannabis uh, paraphernalia to children that are 13, 14 years old and just running with it and not really focusing on the medicinal values, not really focusing on this, that, or the other that actually would be a benefit and a tribute to cannabis itself, but deteriorating it through different policies of just trying to grab as much money as possible and sell to whatever public because there's lack of regulation. You know, what's funny is, um, which is a side to cannabis, but here Reagan is um, demonizing cannabis and importing cocaine in, you know, arms trading. With oh, America. yeah. You know, it's like, dude, oh, yeah, I mean, serious. Like, uh, you know, that, and then the 1994. Yeah, right. And then the 94 crime bill, with Joe Biden, that basically created mass incarceration of anyone. Correct. That, I mean, mostly people of color that did anything, literally anything to be in jail for the rest of their lives. So oh, it's, yeah. it's just I don't know if there's money to be made through legalization for the government. If I mean, OK, well, let's think of it this way. If it was legalized, do you think 280E would be gone? Or do you think 280E would be transformed into a legal drug tax instead of an illegal drug tax, essentially? Well, to be honest, I don't think 280E will change at all. Um, and I don't think so either. The thing is, the thing is 280E focuses not on cannabis itself, but on controlled substances. So if it is an illegal substance, specifically a controlled one substance, that's particularly the law with 280E, and, and it's not just with cannabis, it's also with other hard drugs that are illegal and, and considered a controlled one substance or a controlled two substance. If you're caught illegally or you get arrested or whatever, you still, need to, you still have to pay the taxes on whatever was confiscated or what you were to have sold of, of those items, but you can't write those taxes off. Yeah. So people, in case you don't know, 280E is a punitive tax code from the IRS that says that if you make money from selling or working with or any direct um, contact with a controlled substance, you are not allowed to write off any of your business expenses, which Correct. So, that taxation yeah. alone, I mean, that puts people out of business. You have to get a very good accountant. And I'm not telling you to break the law, but there are ways to work this, but that's why every company should have a good accountant in the first place, but especially in the cannabis industry. Um, you know, it, it's, it's actually like, kind of funny um, I, to, to get to just do a quick point on that. Um, so we, so I worked with, uh, when I was with California Weed Law, we, we did it. We had somebody that was with the, um, um, the California tax board, right? And he was, dirt, he was in during that time where, where I was, I think it was 2008 or something where they said, where the, uh, the tax board said, you know what, you're, we're going to teach you how to do classes on for a medical cannabis business because you're it's a donation center, it's whatever. You can't write those things off on taxes. However, if you were to create a management company and do that, then you can write off taxes because technically the management company is, is the one that owns it and this, that, or the other, and just a lot of different uh, exactly. caveats they have to it on how you can write this off. But the thing is, is we had, we had this guy that write this, that, that wrote this article that he was like, yes, we taught people how to do that for years. And then once cannabis became legal in the cannabis, in the, in the California market, in the adult use market, they turned that around on its head and they started auditing these companies and saying, oh no, what you're doing is illegal. Even mm -hmm. though, even though the tax, the, even though the tax department was the one teaching them the, of the state, they turned back around and said, no, 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 what, you, what you're doing right now is illegal. And that's the crazy thing is they even knew in their offices for that time that they were breaking federal laws. But they still allowed it and taught those classes to make that happen. So when they turned that back on its head the last couple of years, they started arresting multiple people and, and fining companies thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars for doing the exact same process that they were teaching them to do. I'm telling you, dude, California is just one fucked up shit mess 
from hell. Like, I swear, dude, I am not a political person, but our politics are fucked. And of course, because we're the fifth largest economy in the world, like this is where big boys play and corrupt everything. But I know that in the beginning of legalization in Colorado and the beginning of legalization in all of these states, any companies that were operating before then as a medical cannabis company or something like that, they all get audited by the IRS and oh, then they yeah. have Absolutely. insane tax bills. I mean, people go to jail for tax evasion. Like it's no joke. I mean, people just don't understand. This is why I talk more people out of getting into the industry on owning a business side than anything is you are going to get raped by everybody that you're working with from the government, the local government, like every aspect, everyone wants to take a cut. So I'm wondering Instead of descheduling and decriminalizing, which if they descheduled it, there is no 280E tax anyway. So they're going to lose a bunch of money. But if they keep it legal and they keep it schedule one drug, then they get to tax it even more. Right. Like, isn't there right. like a federal alcohol or tobacco tax? Because in California, we're already paying nearly 40 percent tax on cannabis. And that's not including yeah. the federal government. So, you know, if it's right. legal, instead of decriminalizing these scheduled, they can still arrest people. They can still make money in prisons. They could still make a shit ton on taxes. Why would they? I mean, why would they decriminalize? Which, again, is why I'm saying is legalization in our best interest if people still get arrested and we're still taxed to hell and we still don't well, have blanket adoption across the country. And, well, it's and, still that's, a and that's really one. where the question is. Well, that and, that and that's where the that's where the question lies, and and that's where you know my argument is at. So you know, yes, reschedule it, decriminalize it. But here's the problem: when you have just decriminalization and just rescheduling, is de when you do them. that, or de de yeah, Not either re reschedule or deschedule it, whichever whichever way it actually does happen. You know, obviously we have our own mentality of what we want to happen in our in our you know our pipe dreams, but. Yeah. Um, which these are whether <laughs> whether either listening. reschedule right exactly but even when it's, it's like rescheduling descheduling or um, decriminalization whichever comes first or last or however that does work the biggest issue that you're you're that that's really sucks is the fact that there's no law that sets that there that says you know what it's gonna be it's gonna be descheduled it's gonna be rescheduled or it's gonna be decriminalized. And that's law of land. That's not really how it's going to work. So they'll, yeah, sure, they can do a, a blanket decriminalization, um, you know, for everything. But what if they want to recriminalize it again eight years down the road? They can always change that policy. There's not. Couldn't there's they not do anything that with happen. legalization? I mean, exactly how. So with legalization, if you were actually putting it in the annals of the Constitution or made it a constitutional right, put it into put into statutes. Once you get into statutes and, and a lot of these um, uh, political uh, safeguards, there's a reason why it takes forever to get anything done in Congress. It takes forever to get anything done to the Senate. It's because it has to go through all of these red flags, has to go all through all of these measures and purposes to make it something that is constitutional, right? So you have to go through all of these processes to either to either take it away or to add something new on. So if you were to do that, it just creates so many other safeguards for the cannabis space that wouldn't be there if it were just decriminalized or just scheduled. Because okay. you could, all you would have to do is just go back on that, that propaganda to say, you know what, we found this other information, this was fake news or whatever, and you bring that back to where that was and you can most likely, I mean, especially seeing how Trump can expand his powers of executive privilege and, and doing that. What if they just said, you know what, I'm going to create an executive order to say that cannabis is a controlled one substance. I'm going to put that right back with a, with an actual statutory um, product and a statutory amendment that, does, that keeps that away from being able to just immediately change back to becoming a criminalized action. Okay, so let's look at alcohol. Alcohol, what, okay, so before alcohol prohibition, was alcohol something that the government legalized and 
added to the constitution, blah, 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 and protected it. And then something happened and they prohibited it. And then it, it got legalized or was it never legalized in the first place? Then it got prohibited. Then it got legalized. Well, are there, are, is there stuff in the constitution about alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceuticals, other things that supposedly, um, that are, that are being compared to cannabis right now. Um, I mean, I heard well, somewhere that the ATF would be regulating cannabis on a federal level. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, not so a there, fucking... There, there are multiple, gu- there are multiple people, different companies that do that. Know? Yeah, so well, but I'm wondering, not. if we look at alcohol, is there actually a, a constitutional amendment or something for alcohol? Because why would it's cannabis that get that treatment? You know? The only reason I and would why, say that why couldn't is... you pull it back? You know, well, it's not that you couldn't pull it back. It would just be much harder to do so. So, you know, let's utilize let's utilize the uh, the the Constitution and the way the uh, the political process works to its benefit. Right. Because usually it especially with the criminalization of cannabis, as we've seen, we the a lot of the um, big corporations that have been backed backing this anti cannabis platform and the politicians who have rode that wave of of the war on drugs they've utilized and taken hold of the constitutional statutes and the long eras of time that have guided this illegalization in the first place so you put that back on its head and utilize fire with fire and say you know what if we actually get this in there and make it to where it's it's in stone in there then that helps our cannabis space from being just immediately kicked back to an illegal status, um, then all of the years that we've been fo- focusing on doing this have gone in vain. So the reason why I feel it's different from alcohol is because cannabis in its own, in its own right, in its own way, has been stigmatized so much. People all around the world drink alcohol and it's fine, but we've We've somehow created this mentality of an international and on the international side that not just America, even though America is probably the worst with its mentality on cannabis, they've created this international thought process that cannabis will kill you. Cannabis is bad. Cannabis is this. Cannabis is that. And it should be a schedule one substance. Because if you really think about it, it's not just America. This is an international issue. Yeah, and things that's that we still true. have to and- focus on. And I Googled it because I thought, you know what, I do recall something in the Constitution about prohibition, which was the 18th Amendment, which was the, right. uh, yeah, and then the 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition. So it does need to be a constitutional amendment repeal or whatever. Um, dude, man, it's not going to get legalized. I don't know what people are thinking. Like, yeah, I saw the the bank the Safe Banking Act passed what the Senate? Oh passed yeah, the passed the Congress House or something. Yeah, yeah, the House. Um, yeah, that's cool, dude. We really need banking, but I don't see this being fully legal. I just don't because the government. I mean, you know what though? Yeah, it will be legalized because that's how the government gets to keep making money off of cannabis and everybody in every way, whether they're operating legally or illegally. Um, so maybe it will, which sucks. But anyway, so. Let's get back it, to it's your all article. Be on. Oh yeah. Oh wait. Well, what were you gonna say? Oh, well, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. You know, from a lot of it's gonna. A lot of it's gonna flow with where the populace believes of um, whether it should be legalized or not, which a massive portion of America wants it. Uh, now it just has to get past the corporations who are stonewalling it right now. So once we get past that. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost inevitable at this point. And I, and I hate saying that I'd like, you know, there's a silver lining with that, obviously, with everything. But, in, you know, that's obviously the late 70s when we thought cannabis was going to be decriminalized nationwide. But personally, now it's on government platforms, even though this has already happened before. Like, people are, are, are stumping against, you know, stumping for cannabis and showing that it is there. And I think, especially with technology that we have today, there's no way, like, what happened back in the 90s, what happened back in the 80s, what happened back in the 40s, what happened back in the 20s, and even 1898, when you had, or 1896, where you had the uh, Indian, Hemp, um, Indian Hemp Commission report, that every single time throughout those couple of decades, whether that be the LaGuardia report um, or whatnot, or even a 
there was a 70 page um, opinion by the head of the DEA, uh, the head judge of the, of, the, of the DEA, stating that cannabis should be legalized or at least should be a medical, um, of medical value because all of these reports have stated, uh, stated otherwise of what the DEA says is an illegal substance that doesn't do it. And the head of the DEA, this was in the 80s, the head of the DEA just shelved it. He didn't care what the judge was going to say. He was just going to shelve it because it was against their propaganda. But there was even people inside the DEA itself, one of the head people up there that were stating that this should be a medicinal value back in the 80s, got shelved. So we have to change that on its head, right? We have to bring this type of mentality out there. And I think this time around, it's gaining enough support and enough credence where you can't, especially with technology, you can't deny that cannabis has medicinal value. You For can't sure. deny this anymore. You can't just shelve this. You can't just do this. You can't just keep on pushing this aside and throwing it under the rug. Because, and this is something I'm going to be doing um, starting next week, is I'm going to do a series of articles um, based on the top like five research studies and um, or opinions that were written uh, since the criminalization of cannabis. And you know, obviously, asterisks and criminalization of cannabis with marijuana tax act because that technically didn't criminalize it. But regardless, yeah. pulling a strings there. But you know, the top like five articles that, um, you know, that defined cannabis as a medicinal product in the prohibition era, um, and they were huge ones. Like Laguardia report was back in the forties that that reemphasized the hundred different medicinal uses that cannabis can provide um, that uh, that was done by researchers and scientists and third party uh, third party operators and headed by the mayor of New York. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody, well, not everybody knows, but anybody in the industry that is familiar with the history knows the reason why cannabis is still illegal is because it's a massive threat to big pharma, tobacco, and alcohol. Um, and we're already oh, yeah. seeing people start smoking, they stop drinking as much, or they, they stop all their pharmaceuticals. So, you know, yep. when it gets legalized, it's going to favor the big industries that kept it illegal in the first place, you know? Um, yeah. Which especially big pharmaceutical companies, they are all set when it comes to having a relationship with the FDA, when it comes to knowing how to work within the insanity and the bureaucracy of um, an investigative new drug trial, all of these things. And I mean, that's why we see alcohol companies starting to invest in cannabis companies and why we're seeing tobacco companies doing it is yep. because they want their piece. And when they get their piece, it will be legal. But the thing is, oh, the course. dark side of legalization is, okay, well, now that it's legal, maybe there will be more access to people, but is home grows allowed? Who's going to dominate the market? Are any of the, the mom and pop shops going to survive? It's like, I just see once it's legalized, shit is over for practically everybody, especially ethical businesses. They are fucked because ethics well, don't make and- money in this industry. And and I agree on on a on a large standpoint with that, um, but you kind of have to look at both sides, right? You know, you okay. So if if we were to say if we were to have a voice with legalization and actually try to push it, we had some progressives or some you know populist uh, leaders that were really focusing on what the community was talking about and and trying to put enforce laws that were during that realm. Which you know, to be fair. There are some there are some um, uh, politicians now who are focusing on the community first and, and trying to do things for the community, you know, mainly the Democratic side. But just on a surface level, right? Yes, there might be some, some mom and pops that there, there will be some mom and pops that get taken up. There will be some things that that'll happen. There will be you know a lot of major shifts and changes. A lot of big money markets that come in, but. If we focus on expungement and getting all of these all of these records expunged, um, so people can actually live actual lives again, people have access to cannabis where they can 
actually smoke it and not feel like they're going to have to look over their shoulder all the time and get 20 years in jail longer than what a murderer would get usually. Um, and a lot of these products become more free access to get more research studies in and more and more um, access. Then from that angle, yes, it, it is essential to do that. Cause like you were saying, there are still companies getting raided all the time. There are people getting arrested all the time. There are things happening still today where, you know, in legal could be changed states. if there was a specific legal thing. Yeah, and this but is also these legal are state, so legal states. This is the thing. Just because hemp got legalized with the farm bill doesn't mean you can grow it. You know, it means well, you exactly, still have to go through exactly. permitting and get approved and everything. Well, so many states are not going to approve cannabis businesses. I mean, two thirds of California but, doesn't approve cannabis businesses. But if they were to take it out of the CSA, if they were to take it off there, if they were to reschedule it and have some legalization standpoint, even if it's just to say, you know what, take give it to the states if they want to, if they want to illegalize it, they can legalize it, whatever. But the problem is, is a lot of these states, even legal states, you had a lot of these head officers and, and heads of uh, enforcement departments that were just like, I don't care if it's legal, I'm still going to arrest you. And I'm still going exactly. to put you through the process. And as long as I put it up to a federal level, then you're still fucked. Yep. But I just, I don't so know, man. If, if took it's that still, away. I guess, but it's still going to be a crime if it's legalized, if you're not following the rules completely, which is if you still don't have access where you live, then what good is legalization to you? You're still going to get arrested. <laughs> you know, well, I don't. You can at least go I, to a place that, that does, that does assist with that. It, I think a lot of these states, a lot of these counties would change their mind if it was if it was technically changed on a federal level. I mean, you got to think about it in the sense that a lot of these a lot of these strong right Republican states and counties are not allowing these. They're like, well, it's still illegal on a federal level. So they obviously still believe that it's controlled one substance and that it has no medicinal value. So why would we want to do this? And they have Touché. this entire mentality of that is, this is wrong and that this is bad and that you're, why would I go against the federal government on this and whatnot? But if this were to change on a federal level, I think this would change a lot of the minds saying, you know what, at least do some type of regulations against or, or regulations for it so we can start providing something that can be um, at least managed and manageable. Um, but also they would start seeing an exodus of a lot of these, a lot of these counties because even though it's legal in a lot of states, and we've seen an exodus of, of people from non-legal states to legal states for, for use of cannabis, they still have this they still have this thing looming over their head, which is the federal prohibition. So if this federal prohibition goes away, and there's certain legalities that go in there saying that, just like with the hemp bill, or with the farm bill that legalized hemp, even though it didn't do a lot in the FDA and the USDA still have to put their policies through. They still made it legal for them transportation to go from state to state, and they've legalized, you know, transportation between state and state. So well, there are a lot of people that travel with cannabis. That's a huge benefit for them to be able to have this vote to where it's now legal in the, uh, federally, and they, can, they don't have to deal with this anymore. But it'll also change the consensus of a lot of the, the officers, because even though the officers will arrest them in a legal state, the first thing they're going to do is jump them up to a felony. And that's actually yeah. what happened in my situation. I got pulled over in Arizona and they Ooh, found that I had cannabis Arizona. in my car. Yeah. They're yeah. Scary. I hate Arizona. They don't fuck but, I'm from Arizona. I, I've been arrested. Yeah. I don't know a single person who hasn't been arrested for weed in Arizona. So like, I, I yeah, got pulled over. Scary. I got a citation and I mean, I had a, I had a, I had a medical cannabis recommendation, but it expired. And they still gave me a citation, but then they dropped the citation and put six felonies on me. Jesus and I had to Christ. go through a legal process to get that out of the way. You know, now that you mention it, when I was in high school, I got super high before PE and we were doing Taibo and I could not stop laughing. It was so funny. I was like four steps behind everyone. And obviously I got caught and I got sent to the principal's office and I got arrested and I got taken to juvie and they were trying to charge me with drugs in a drug-free zone, which is a felony. Um, 
They yep. said that I was distributing it, which is absolutely insane just because me and my friend got high, you know, then they're like, where's the weed? And it's not on campus. It was by the rocks by the campus. So it was like, oh, possession of a minor, like all kinds of things. And then luckily it all got dropped for drug counseling and nothing, nothing stuck. But they, they do not give any fucks at all in Arizona. Um, they're a huge prison state, though. I mean, that's where their money comes oh, yeah. from in a lot of ways. I mean, any, any state that welcomes Joe Arpaio with open arms and wants to elect him to the government is just a fucked up place. But anyways, I'm getting sidetracked on that because, oh, my God, yeah, it's scary. Look, as long as if federal legalization meant that cannabis offenses would no longer be felonies. But in the end, it's like, let's look at the vape situation, not getting into it too much, but what a gift for anti-cannabis people. And, you know, oh, for, oh yeah, I mean, you, I mean, if you wanted companies. anything to come on a silver platter, if not a gold platter, I mean, there it is right there. Exactly. So like I was telling you before we started, I just downloaded that, um, App. Hold on. Let me look. I forget. I keep forgetting the name of it. Um, Next door. And I, I made a post on there. I'll read it because I suck at um, recalling things, obviously. But hold on. So I was like, dude, first of all, if you've come to Venice, I don't know if you've been here since Prop 64. Every half yeah. mile, we have billboards everywhere. I mean, just down oh, the yeah. street, I still have that billboard of the two contorted practically naked women, one of them with a vape cartridge between her legs. I'm pretty sure that company doesn't even exist. Um, but I made a post saying what used to be considered an illegal drug is now being advertised on bill billboards all over our neighborhood. Unfortunately, right. there's not nearly enough reliable information out there for consumers, let alone for medical users, and least of all for can of curious non-users. Um, I teach cannabis science classes for companies in the public, and I'm curious if there's an interest in small classes for the can of curious where no question is a dumb question. There are a lot of misconceptions that need to be addressed, and it's my pleasure to address them. I've gotten a really mm -hmm. good feedback from people that are yeah. freaked out by the vape situation, especially where they're like, mm -hmm. dude, what chemicals are out there? Like, what is safe? What is it? And I think that the government needs to be educated too. But I honestly don't think our lobbying organizations are educating the government about cannabis. I think they're just lobbying for their interests because there's still they this. Yeah. Well, that's fucking bullshit. And I would love to just educate politicians from a completely like objective place where I'm not trying to get them to do anything other than understand the science. It's so not scary once you understand, but you have to be able to learn in the first place. So I think, right. And, you know, really just and that's, informing and that's everyone. exactly what we're trying to know. do too. Yeah, exactly. Like education is so important, um, but people don't know what they don't know. They don't know. And that's the biggest problem because right now, especially with the vape crisis, which is not really a crisis, but it's made out to be. Um, this is not good for the cannabis industry, especially when I'm hearing now doctors saying we think it might be THC and something else. That's right. such bullshit. Like it's not right. THC. It's got nothing to do with cannabis. And then uh, one of our local city council people wants to do an all out ban on vaping. And I'm reading the comments yep. and some people are like, cannabis smoke is so invasive and everything. OK, cool. So then why are you trying to ban the least invasive inhalation form of cannabis that is, Correct. it doesn't smell bad. Like it's not offensive. You're not giving people an option and excuse me, but last time I checked criminals don't really care about the laws and regulations. So what are they doing? Right. They're just creating a market for it. In the right. end, the so only now way they're I banning think, it and, and they're creating all this, all this mayhem for no reason. Yeah. I think the only way at this point to regulate this vape situation is to scare the shit out of people into only going to legal companies. The problem is, is legal yes. companies are getting destroyed by this as well. And that's the problem is we need to offer a solution, not just terrify everyone. And the solution is go buy your products from legitimate people that have lab test results, period. That's the answer. Regulation is not going to change criminal activity, except make it better if you make it too overregulated. You know, that's the problem right, right. 
And they also have to not, the, the government also just cannot be greedy. You know, the, the biggest issue that the California market has, and the reason why legalization, well, aside from enforcement, obviously, because they lack, lack enforcement for it, but they, the fact that they're charging all this massive excise tax and percentages on taxes for these products, which go to the end user. You know, these companies still have to make money and do this. So they're not obviously going to eat all that cost. So a lot of it's going to go to the end user, like I've reported on a long time and you've reported on. It's just raising the prices twofold, threefold, when people can get it much cheaper on, on the illicit market. So exactly. stop being greedy. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, to be, to be honest, there's, there's a, there's a really cool business ideology, especially when you're an entrepreneur. It's, you know, I don't want a hundred percent of anything. I want, I want five or 10% of everything. So yeah. if you were to lower the taxes and introduce more people into the market, and that's why I've been in U of I have had this conversation multiple times of we think that the California that the California market in general, just the adult use market, was a setup for failure. And that they, mm-hmm. they put all of this stuff in there just to make it fail so then they could make their money off it and recriminalize it and say, you know what, this was a this was a this was a failed effort. Obviously when we legalize it, it makes it worse and it makes and, and that's the biggest issue. A lot of people think that the that California is a very liberal country liberal state, and it's really not. It's only in certain cities that have a very liberal, uh, democratic, uh, yeah. progressive ideology. Sacramento yeah. itself is extremely re- uh, far right. And yeah. most of these bills that go through are empty bills. They have, they have nothing of, of substance in these bills. Even Prop 64 didn't have a lot of writing in the bill. And they, have a, and they wrote all of the uh, laws um, that were attached to it after it was already passed. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. I don't know. I mean, you can overtax it, but when two thirds of the state opted out, you're not going to make enough tax money to enforce. And right now, exactly. I mean, I don't know how much are they paying the National Guard to raid cities? That's a lot of money right now. I don't think they're pulling in any money because they're spending it all on enforcement, which you wouldn't exactly. have to enforce it everywhere if these freaking cities and counties would just regulate their industry. It seems so easy. Right. Not. And you're right. It, California is only liberal in a few spots. That's why we've had before in the past um, propositions where people wanted to split California into three or five different states because they're like, yes. but like most of them all just want to cut off the coast. <laughs> they're like, all right, fuck those guys. We don't want anything to do with LA. Everyone wants to cut off Los Angeles. And I don't blame them. <laughs> you know, we're we're just a failed city here, you know. Every day with the homeless, it's just not. <laughs> that's it's not that's good, completely true. Because you know? no, I mean, there's there's so many there's so many issues with the city of L.A. It's it's and uh, I cannot think of a much more corrupt city than uh, than Seriously. L.A., especially in the Cal in the state of California. Exactly. So you know, where there's money, there's corruption for sure. But I mean, yeah. we're coming to the end of this episode and we're probably just going to do more episodes because as this evolves, um, as do my thoughts and my feelings about things, I'm not totally set in one way. You know, I just need I just I just need to understand better or you know, to hear better better options than what we have, or at least whatever's going to happen. We cannot just sit by and let it happen like they did in California because it's really hard to undo what you do, you know? Right. And, and, and I think that's, I think that's the major key out of all of this is to, to say, you know what? Yes, we have our ideologies. We have, we have things that, you know, as advocates, but also logical thinking adults, um, there's two conflicting ideologies, right? You know, of course we want to have everything legal. We want to be able to do what we want to do. We want to have all these things, but we also have to think about the human factor. We have to think about the ideologies of what everyone else is trying to do in the situation. And unfortunately to make anything pass to where it is legal, we have to see the, see everyone's side. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big division especially with me and with you of, okay, we have to do something because if we don't do something, then it's going to be like every other thing we've always wanted to have passed 
not what we wanted because we just let somebody else decide for us and it's never going to be what we want. So we need to make a decision on what makes sense. How do we make this work? Because we have to make this work. We can't just sit on, we just can't sit on our laurels and think, okay, this is just going to, this is going to be legalized and it's going to be done the right way. It's never going to be done like that. We have to make sure that we're present and make this type of statement of this is what needs to be done. This is how it should be done. And at least if we push that far out, we can at least make concessions on 20% of it. So 80% of what we want is actually there instead of not doing anything. And 80% of what we don't want is there. Yeah. So again, pipe dreams, uh, cause you know, in the end, money influences everything in our government. So whatever the money does, that's what's going to happen. Happen. But, and, you know, better to at least stand up and be a part of something than to just be butthurt like I am, you know? Um, so, right. But, don't in, take an in, example just, in, I guess, as, I guess, as a last thought with, for me would be look, let's fight fire with fire, right? Okay. It, people think about it on a monetary sense, an economical sense. What's going to make the money? What's going to do that? So if we open the doors and we provide the avenues for where money can come in, but still be able to regulate how the money comes in and supporting new growth, especially from the people who have been disadvantaged in, um, assaulted in this, in this uh, war on drugs and bring them up through there and give them opportunity to do this. That would be the Amen, best brother. way to look yeah. at that instead of hoping that they're just going to do something that's legal and then they're just going to allow all big, big businesses to come in. So we have to have a voice. We have to have a push into it because if we're not focused on this and we just let it happen, it's going to happen eventually. We need to ha- at least have a say so that they don't completely screw us. Totally. Yeah. So people get active, look online for groups in your state, in your city, even if you're not in a legal state, I guarantee there are groups that are pro cannabis that you can be a part of. And I mean, it starts with your Congress people and your senators and your politicians that represent you in the federal level. Um, I mean, hopefully. Yes, and we and we have we have our own uh, company. It's uh, CBD Society, CBD Society, US dot org. Um, I built that entire site of everything you could possibly want to know about CBD, but we're creating, we're going to be creating uh, conventions and going to make it a pack organization for specifically uh, politicians that we can teach and educate and also support the people who do support cannabis. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely want to be a part of that. Um, so tell people how they can contact you. Um, they can contact me, uh, um, via email, um, brad at natures with an S secret holdings.com. Um, and our website for our parent company is nature secret holdings.com. Uh, we also have, uh, our educational platform, uh, www.cbdsocietyus.org and our two companies that we have live that are product lines are CBD spa, CBD spa.us and CBD Patriot, CBD Patriot US, and ever twenty percent of all of our proceeds from any sale for CBD Patriot goes to a veterans organization. Awesome, that's super necessary, and I love that you're so active doing this and bringing positivity to a regulatory morass. Um, and I would like to Absolutely. thank my listeners for tuning in for another episode, and stay tuned because. There's just so much bullshit to cover, and I truly (laughs) enjoy covering it. So, um, everybody, have a great day, and I'll see you next time. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review on your favorite podcast host. It really helps us get the truth out to a larger audience. You can follow us on Instagram at CannaBSPod and on LinkedIn at The CannaBS Detector. Show notes and links to articles referenced in this episode are available on our website, CannaBSPod.com. Is there a topic you want to hear or do you have some BS you'd like to tell our audience? Send us a message on Instagram at CannaBSPod. Stay skeptical.